There was a pilot flying a small plane, one of those two-seater jobs, like a, what do they call it, a Piper Cub? He's flying the plane and he's reaching a point of uh, having a problem, a real problem. So he radios the nearest airport and he says, uh, pilot to tower, pilot to tower. Uh, my altitude is 600 feet. I'm 300 miles from the airport and I'm out of fuel. There was a pause. The dispatcher radios back, tower to pilot, tower to pilot. Repeat after me, our Father, who art in heaven. At that point, what do you do? You pray. So many times we pray, when we ask for things, we may ask for them desperately. And we wonder if God hears, maybe. We wonder if it's going to come, the thing that we're asking for. And so in this three-part sermon series that I've been, been preaching, and this is the middle message next week, is uh, the, the final installment. Next week I'm going to talk about barriers to prayer, what keeps us from having effective prayer life. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some of the answers that we get when we pray. And the first answer I want to talk about is the answer that we always want to hear when we pray, a prayer of petition, and that's what I'm talking about this morning, prayers of petition, when we're asking for something. There's all kinds of prayers, right? You can you can have a prayer of confession, you can have a, a prayer of thanksgiving or a prayer of praise, but when you're, when you're asking for something, there are several different kinds of answers that God can give you, and the one is yes. Yes, that's the answer we want to hear, right? We ask something of God, we want to hear God say yes, and to do it immediately for us would be even better. Uh, this is you know, the age of drive through everything, right? You can get just about anything driving through a pharmacy or McDonald's or whatever. So we're, we're used to instant gratification. And there are actually times in the Bible when people ask things of God and received it instantly. In uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, there's a man with leprosy approaches Jesus and uh, he has this terrible disease. Leprosy was a terrible thing. We don't hear much about it in today's world, but it was this disease that would eat away your skin and some people would lose fingers and hands because of it. And he comes to Jesus and he says, if you will, you can heal me. And Jesus says, yes, I will. And it says it reaches out, he reaches out and touches him. And immediately, the word is used immediately in that verse, he is healed. So right away, he got what he wanted. I think it's amazing, as an aside, that Jesus touched him and wasn't afraid to touch him. And didn't say, oh, uh, yeah, who be healed. Because what that man needed was not only to be cured of his disease, but to be touched. Because if you have leprosy, nobody's been touching you. And to go without being touched for a long time can be a lonely thing. And I bet Jesus knew that. So he reaches out and touches him and heals him on several levels. Beautiful thing. And it happens right away. It says immediately, he's healed. And then the, the next story in Matthew 8 is... Uh, a soldier, a centurion, comes to Jesus and makes a request for his servant. He said, I've got this servant back home. He's sick. Can you help me out? And Jesus suggests that maybe he'll come and visit this person in an effort to try to heal him. And the soldier says, you know what? You don't even need to come to my home because I believe in your power. And I know if you just say the word that my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, so be it. So the soldier goes home, checks on the servant, and finds out the servant was healed. And, and then the, the soldier inquires at what hour was the servant healed. And it says he learned that it was at the same hour that he was having that conversation with Jesus. So it was one of those immediate, boom, you ask for it, yes, you've got it. But that doesn't always happen in life, does it? I don't know about your prayer life. But in my prayer life, everything that I ask for doesn't always happen immediately like that. Sometimes the answer is no. In fact, sometimes the answer is no way from God. Uh-uh-uh, you're not getting it. It's not right for you. It's not good for you. Sometimes it's no because we ask from an uninformed position. There's another story in Matthew chapter 20 
where uh, the two disciples, James and John, their mother has a conversation with Jesus. And she's a proud mother. She's got these two sons that are ace number one disciples. And she says to Jesus, hey, have you checked out my two boys? Oh, yeah, mighty fine disciples. So uh, what do you say when you come in your kingdom, sort of like one on your left and one on your right, you know? And Jesus says, hey, that's not for me to give out. That's, that's something the Father will decide, and it's, I'm guessing, predetermined. Uh, so, no, that's not going to happen. She's asking from an uninformed position. She doesn't realize how that sort of thing works. So the answer was no. Sometimes the answer to your prayer is no, because what you're asking for isn't what's good for you. Over the summer, I read a book about prayer, and the author used the illustration on this point, saying he had a five-year-old son who wanted a penknife. Does that sound like a good idea? The boy wanted a penknife, so the father said, no, I'm sorry, son, you, know, you can't, you're a little too young to be playing with knives. Well, a year later, when he was all of six, his mother was with him in a store, and they saw the Swiss knife in the window, and she just thought it was the coolest thing. So she bought the six-year-old boy the Swiss knife. And, well, six stitches later, they all learned that the answer should have been no, because he wasn't ready to receive that. He might have wanted it, but it wasn't good for him. And in the same way, our Heavenly Father sometimes has to say no, because whatever you're asking for, I'm asking for, it's not good for us. We might think it is. We think we know what's best for us. But you know what I've discovered? It's amazing. God knows better than I do. How about that? And he knows better than you do. So sometimes the answer has to be no. Besides, if God said yes every time you asked for something, wow, what would that be like? We're all millionaires. How boring. Some of your bosses, no longer your boss. What happened to Charlie? I don't know. He disappeared. <laughs> yeah, if you got everything you asked God for, imagine that. Kids at school picking on you. How come he's hanging upside down from the playground, from the swing? I don't know. It's the strangest thing. Just said a prayer and whew. Yeah, no, we can't get everything that we want. I mean, you know, if you're a parent, and you have kids, you have grandchildren, try giving them everything they ask for. Every new video game that comes out, every new toy, get them the latest iPhone as soon as it comes out, give them everything that they want. Hey, how fun are they going be, to be, uh, to be around? Spoiled brat, right? Isn't that the expression we use? Somebody gets everything that they want? God knows better. Sometimes the answer just has to be no. And sometimes the answer is stay tuned. Stay tuned. Because, you know, after all, what prayer is really about is this connection to God. It's a way of maintaining a relationship with God. And so God wants us to keep coming back, and coming back in their prayer, and, and staying tuned in and being close. And if we have to continue to ask, then we continue to consult God and seek God. So in Matthew 7, when it says, ask, and you shall receive, sounds like a magic formula, doesn't it? All you got to do is ask, and boom, there it is. Not exactly all the time. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Well, those, those expressions to me represent an ongoing activity. Asking, asking, seeking, seeking. That, to me, speaks of time. Looking, looking, seeking, knocking, ongoing activity. And in the seeking and knocking and asking, we draw closer to God, and that's the goal. So as to say, getting whatever it is we wanted is almost secondary to the primary goal of drawing close to God. You know, let me say this as an aside. Sometimes we as followers of Jesus get confused. We think God, God's goal for us is to be happy. God wants everybody to be happy. No. There's a difference between happiness and joy. 
the Bible talks about the joy of the Lord. If you have a relationship with Christ, then you understand that your sins are forgiven and that you're whole in the eyes of God. And that when this body wears out, there's a place waiting for you where you'll live forever and ever. And that gives us a joy and a peace. And that bubbles up from within. Happiness comes from the word happenstance. It's based on the circumstances in your life. If you wake up tomorrow and you've got a flat tire and you're sick to your stomach and you're throwing up, you're not going to be happy. But you, might, you should still have the joy of the Lord because that comes from within. It's not based on what's happening to you. It's based on what's happening within you because of your relationship with God. Does that make sense? It's a big difference between the two. God's goal for you is not to be happy, but for you to be in full fellowship with him, to have a closeness. Because if you've got that, then everything else falls into place. You'll find the strength that you need, the direction, everything else that you need to live this life while you're here on earth. So sometimes the answer is stay tuned. Keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking. And sometimes the answer will come in a way that you didn't expect but it's the answer. Let me explain what I mean. When I was a senior in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do after high school. I didn't have a clue. Um, and I really didn't like school. So going to college just really didn't excite me. But all my friends were going to college. So I thought, well, I guess I should at least try and start in college, because that's what everybody else seems to be doing. So I sat down with my high school guidance counselor, Mrs. Friedman, and uh, that poor woman was trying to help me figure out what to do with my life. I have a healthy respect for guidance counselors. I don't know if there's any guidance counselors here today, but, you know, helping kids like me just kind of figure out what you want to do with life. So she brings out the list. It's the list of interests that a person might have, you know. Are you into gardening or karate or, you know, all this stuff? Hoping that she'll name one thing and I'll go, yeah, that's it. That's what I want to do in life. So she gets to animals. And she says, well, do you like animals? And I said, well, I got a cat. <laughs> yeah, I like animals. Yeah, sure. Good, she says, because at Camden County College, there's a program for uh, to train people to be an animal science technologist. <laughs> I said, wow, um, I'm on board with that. That sounds important. I didn't really know what it was going to be, but it was something like training to be a veterinary assistant. So I didn't have any other direction, so I signed up, and I went to Camden County College, and I want you to know your pastor has an associate's degree in laboratory animal science. <laughs> Thank you. If your dog or cat gets sick, don't bring them to me <laughs> because I don't remember a thing that I learned. Because as you might guess, my life took a, a turn and I went in a different direction. But I went and I studied and I graduated. And when I got done, you know what? I had two job opportunities. I had two interviews. Both went great. And I'm thinking, wow, this is terrific. But I knew which one I wanted. You see, the one was in Philadelphia at a big pharmaceutical company. And the pay and the benefits were. The other job was in Camden, in a less than desirable neighborhood, and it was a uh, nonprofit cancer research laboratory. In both cases, I would be like doing things with laboratory animals, you know, like taking care of them, and doing other experiments and things. So I'm praying and I'm wishing and I'm hoping that I'm going to go to Philadelphia at this big pharmaceutical. I'm going to make a good salary. I got benefits and all. Well. Guess which job I didn't get? The one that looked so good, the one in Philadelphia. So I ended up going to this place in Camden called the Institute for Medical Research. That sounds impressive too, doesn't it? Where do you work? The Institute for Medical Research. And I work with laboratory animals, rats, mice, guinea pigs. And I would take care of them and I would do little experiments and do little autopsies, all kinds of things. And uh, I came to know that my supervisor there was a former evangelist in New York. And as I began to talk to him about my faith journey, he began to share with me his faith journey. And as I began to wonder what to do with my life, because it wasn't with animals, he began to talk to me about ministry. 
and if I'd ever thought about becoming a pastor. I said, nope, and I'm not planning on thinking about it. So it took a while. His name was Jose Valez, and he helped lead me in the direction that brings me to you here today. He was the best man in my wedding. God used him in tremendous ways to shape my life and my journey. It was not the answer to my prayer. I wanted the other job because my flesh said, more money, more benefits, yeah, Philadelphia. God said, but I want what's best for you. And I know what's best for you more than what you know is best for you. And I'm so glad that God got his way and had his way in my life. Because ever since then, I've felt an assurance that I'm, I'm going in the right direction. But that's how it works sometimes with prayer. What looks like a no is a disguised yes. Because what I was really asking in that prayer was, Lord, just help me to find my way in life. I really don't know what I want to do. Sometimes we get the answer, but it's not, it doesn't look like what we thought. Augustine, I think I mentioned last week in the service uh, about him being one of these great churchmen. You know, if you, if you study theology, you go to seminary, you're going to study the works of Augustine, great churchman, who, great theologian, lived centuries ago. When, uh, when he was a young man, he was a rabble rouser. He loved to carry on and party and chase women. And his mother was a dear saint. And she prayed for him and prayed for him, Oh, Lord, help Augie to find his way in the path of faith. But he just kept on partying. And it reached a point in Augustine's life where he wanted to sail off to Paris because that was a party place. And that poor woman, his mother, got on her knees and she prayed every day, Lord, don't let him get on that boat. Lord, don't let him get on that boat. Because she just was afraid she'd totally lose him. Well, the day came for him to depart, and he got on the boat, and off he went. And there in Paris, he experienced the influence of the Spirit and met the people who were going to change his life in Christ, and he became the great churchman that he was. So did God answer her prayer as a yes? Yes, but it was sort of a stay tuned or not yet because she couldn't see that it was answered the way she wanted until it was down the road, and it wasn't answered in the way she thought. But you see, that's the beautiful thing about praying to God. God understands the desire of your heart. That's what prayer is, a simple definition. It's the soul sincere desire, the prayer of the heart. God hears and God understands what you're really saying in your prayer. So it may not play out the way you've asked, but God will lead in the right way because God knows what's best. We're down here on earth trying to figure things out. And up above, God sees the bigger picture and knows what's been, what is, and what will be. I like to think of it this way, just to close. The marching band. Anybody here ever been in marching band? Time to come out of the closet. That's right, marching band. I never did. I couldn't march or play an instrument, so they wouldn't let me in. But um, I have a healthy respect for people in marching band. I noticed that when I would go down on the, the, the football field, when the marching band was playing and marching, that uh, it just looks like a mess. I mean, I don't know how the director figures all that out, but if, you, if you're down on the field where people are marching and playing, it just looks like, you know, it's like, what's, what's up with this, you know? But if you go up higher, go up in the last row of the bleachers and look down, and what will you see? A beautiful formation all planned, all aligned. It'll be an image, it'll be words, whatever it is they're, they're moving to make. And you can see it from up there. I like to think that God, looking down, sees the bigger picture for you and me and your life as it unfolds. Down here might look like a mess. What am I going to do? I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to lose my job. I don't know. But up above, God says, I got this. And he sees how the whole thing is going to play out. And he wants to reassure you and me if we'll just keep coming back, asking, seeking, knocking, in prayer, so that he can give you that peace, so that he can give you that reassurance. Whether you're flying a plane that feels like it's out of gas, or whether you're struggling to raise your family, God's there and God wants to help. What we need to do is trust and obey. Amen.
One of my favorite singers is Tennessee Ernie Ford. I always wanted to sing like him. And one of the songs that I constantly hear in my head is prayer is the key to heaven, but it is faith that unlocks the door. If you want God to answer your prayer according to his will, you need to put your faith and your trust in him. In response to the word of God today, let us turn into our hymnals to hymn number 467, Trust and Obey, for there is no other way. Shall we stand to the glory of God? Number 467. When in fellowship swing, we will stand and hand his feet, and the glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but our toil he doth richly Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows for the joy he bestows nor for them who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sin at his feet. For we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other to trust us. 